Mona. So, so let's continue following this strategy, because that's what it is, path, strategy, a sequence of methods presented here in this, this manual of pith instructions by Benjana Bhaji. Now focusing, of course, on Vipassana and specifically focusing on really understanding the nature of the self, how the self does exist and how the self doesn't exist, right? But the first part I found very interesting. I, I, I'm not sure I've seen it elsewhere. I, found it, I continue to find it interesting. And that is this careful examination. We've done it, but it, it bears doing more than once. Uh, examining the way we abide, the way we abide, right? In contrast to the mode of appearances, which we all know, we appear in very different ways. Even, you know, when I'm, when I just look in the mirror sometimes, I see very different things, even from one day to the next. I see very different things. Not, you know, I don't mean anything mystical, it's just kind of like different. <laughs> Older, <laughs> different. But even from day to day, I mean, I've, I've just noticed that. You know, just, I don't look the same, even from the morning to the afternoon. One thing I do know is I look the worst when I'm in a barber shop. <laughs> I don't know why that is, but that guy staring back from the mirror is just pug ugly. <laughs> really. <laughs> I've noticed that every time. I think there must be some kind of a special mystique in the barber shops to make you look ugly. <laughs> so I know I look the worst. Like, oh, I don't even want to look. <laughs> so, but that's the superficial. That's just visual impression, right? But then we know in, in more meaningful ways. The myriad ways in which we manifest in the world. Well, very, very different. And ever-changing. Always was changing on the one hand, but in the contrast to that, the, the way of abiding, the way of being present, such that when I think back to my childhood, I have a sense of identity. That was me when I was a child. I see a photo of myself as a child, adolescent, and so forth. Uh, that was me. If someone right now should praise me when I was a teenager, when you were a teenager, you were such and such, I'd feel, oh, thank you. And if a person puts me down when you when you are you know when you're in your twenty years, she was so uptight, such a hard ass. I've been told that actually. <laughs> <laughs> when I was a discipline in, disciplinarian in the monastery, oh my fellow monks told me, Alan, you have no idea, you are such a hard ass. <laughs> and I feel, oh, <laughs> that's like thirty-five years ago, you know. But oh, okay. so something abiding, some sense that you're referring to me, right? Appearance is very, very different. Child, young man, older man, etc. But what is abiding? So we examine that. It's worth coming back to and, uh, and examining. Uh, who are you? and What is it that bears that continuity that you, you, know, you identify, you recognize yourself? That's going to be really helpful to have a sense of that. It's not locked into this appearance or that appearance but something that continues over time, that you say, yes, you're such and such a, year, a number of years old, and you were this, and you were this, and later you'll be this, and so forth. Let alone, in the bigger picture, you know, from lifetime to lifetime. You know, because highly realized beings will say, His Holiness Dalai Lama has said, when he was asked once, you know, it was in Australia, I heard, if any of you are here, you know, and I say anything incorrect, it was, he was giving a talk, uh, in some place in Australia, not in Melbourne or Sydney, someplace else. And it was a public discourse, I think many people there, of course. And someone raised the question, he said, Is ho- Your Holiness, you, know, you refer to yourself as a simple Buddhist monk, and no realization, all of that. But sometimes we'd, you know, we'd really like to be inspired by hearing about your actual realization. Would you be willing to be a bit more candid? And what I heard, it's a second hand, but what I heard, I said, well, you have a point. You have a point. Well, in that case... I can remember being with the Buddha. I can remember before that living in Egypt. Uh, after that, I can remember being a pundit in, in ancient India. So, yes. Were you there? I remember the, the Egypt part. <coughs> Say again? I remember the part about the Egypt. Egypt, yeah. Egypt. And what really <laughs> brings me to tears, even when I say it again, I remember being with the Buddha. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so here is a person, you know, he, he does, he, he is candid on occasion when he sees. It's like administering some really strong medicine. 
when he sees, okay, now, now's the time. He doesn't go around saying that. But when it's appropriate, it's not, it's not uniform, never tell, like it's some kind of a super secret. But it's also don't broadcast, don't highlight, don't try to impress people. You know. But he does on occasion. He is more candid. So here's a person who is now 80, 80, soon to be 81 years old, and saying, I was, I remember being there with the Buddha 2,600 years ago. I remember being in Egypt. And it's a sense of continuity, right? That was me in a previous appearance. Right? So this is what we're really looking at. Now we can't, most of us don't have that ability, although I've met quite a number of people uh, who I respect and really you know, have great respect for, who do claim to have past life recall and show some real evidence of that. But let's set that aside for the time being, just within this life. I remember in a previous incarnation living in a little one-room one room apartment in the center of Göttingen, right across from the cathedral, and eating muesli and, mus- muesli and dried fruit and yogurt every day, and reading and meditating and smoking dope. <laughs> I remember that young man, you know. <laughs> not me. He's not. He's not this one. I haven't smoked dope for a long, long time. But I remember that was me in an, in an earlier incarnation, and so forth. And then the early times in Dharamsala, boy, very different. And so, what is identifying? What is that common? That the one who abides, because we're not speaking gibberish here. I mean, one can believe or not believe in, in reincarnation. To my mind, it's, it's almost self-evident. But clearly, we are reborn every time we wake up in the morning. Clearly, we're reborn every time we slip into a new dream. And then we die from the dream, born into another dream. And then we die, and then we're born into waking state. And then we die, and we fall asleep, and so forth. So in this miniature, miniature, clearly. So, so to make this short, because I want to get back to the text. What is it about that abides? It's you. It's a person. And we're not talking about something that doesn't exist, because you do. You were a young man. You were a young lady. You were a girl, right? It's true. And there is continuity. And yes, that was. This is all meaningful speech. And so identifying what is it? Who is that person? What is the person who abides? And then seeing, it's really subtle. This is just, to my mind, brilliant phenomenology, and I don't recall having seen this. Glenn or, or Glenn or Anna, you've read a lot, to study a lot. Have you seen that particular modality before in other texts? Of examine your way of, your, your neluk, nangsul, and ranzinsul. Your way of being present, your way of appearing, and the way you apprehend you. Have you seen that elsewhere? Not in the way you're explaining it. Yeah. And he says it just really simply, right there, but... I think I'm just saying what it says in Tibetan. I'm not doing something special sin. Have you seen that? It's fascinating, isn't it? Because what I'm used to is identify the object of refutation and they do parts holes analysis to, you know, do any of the myriad reasonings of Nagarjuna, Chantakirti and so forth and so on. That's what I'm really familiar with. This one, it really does have that purely phenomenological flavor of Mahamudra, which is, I find just absolutely enchanting, you know. Like in the Insight chapter in Spacious Path to Freedom, I just adore that chapter. Because it's just so, so radically empirical. It you know? doesn't invite us to get caught up in head trips and just intellectual entertainment. Well, this is, this is true here too. He's saying, examine closely, investigate closely. How do you appear to abide as you examine yourself? How do you appear to appear as you examine yourself? How do you apprehend yourself? This is radically empirical, right? But now we segue to the next meditation, which we're going to bring, begin very shortly. You'll probably want to do that meditation more than once until we have a sense, this is what abides. This is what abides. And knowing that's not a delusional statement. you know. And then we go to this practice here. So I guided you earlier, basically just read uh, Padmasambhava. You remember? It was right after he's finished settling the mind its natural state. And he says, do this until you're finished, right? Don't be introduced to Rikpa too soon. And then it goes right to the next chapter, and in his Vipassana chapter, then the first stage was engaging in the search for the mind. Right? You've just settled your mind in its natural state. You've simplified it down to its raw core, 
its essential nature, right? So you see it unadorned, naked. That is, without the clothing of gender, age, ethnicity, personal history, and all that stuff, which is all fine. But if you really like to know that, if you really like to know the mind, you might want to just see it stripped clean of all the barnacles, all the stuff that's added to it, which can be taken away. When you strip it down to the substrate consciousness, you really can't, you can't just kind of pluck out. You can release gender, you can release ethnicity and all of that personal history. That's not a problem. You can go right beyond it. But when you come down to that, that just that crystal clear flow of sparkling water of your flow of awareness as you're resting in the substrate consciousness, self-illuminating. You, you can't pluck off anything. You can't take, well, let's see what it's like without the luminosity. Let's see it, what it's like without the cognizance. Well, then it's not there anymore. It's like looking at fire and say, well, let's look at the fire, but take out the heat. That's, then, then it's not fire anymore, right? That's what abides, right? What abides of you? Because there you are. You've been around for a number of years. You weren't born yesterday. What abides of you? And then we go to the next meditation. And we'll seek out, as he, Padmasambhava, all focusing on mind, says now we engage in the search for the mind. right? And then pointing out Rigpa. That was the process, remember? The one, two. Engaging in the search for the mind and the not finding and then identifying what's left. Oh, Rigpa, pristine awareness, right? So, identifying what abides, its manner of abiding, how does it abide? What is it that abides from day to day, decade to decade? That, at least we know what we're talking about. And some people, like His Holiness, know what they're talking about. When they also said, as he'll say very gently, I feel a very strong affinity with the 15th Dalai Lama. <laughs> and he'll say, I feel strong affinity with the 5th Dalai Lama. You know, well, read between the lines, you know, it's not too hard to figure out. But for the rest of us, ordinary people, or subordinary people, you know, like me, at least we know this. So having known that, let's go into the next into the next practice. Okay? Good. Find a comfortable position.